<laughs> the X870E Creator Wi-Fi from Asus? Yes. Yes, it's been updated. The X670E Creator from Asus was one of our favorite boards. No RGB, 10 gigabit. What's not to love? Well, the price. It was kind of pricey. Asus is known as the premium brand. They don't always live up. Asus! But sometimes, sometimes they get it right. And the X870E Creator Wi-Fi, this is no exception. This is one of the best AM5 motherboards that you can get. Full ECC support, good IOMMU groups, onboard 10 gigabit, Wi-Fi 7. A reasonably okay PCIe layout, though I wish it had more slots. We'll talk about that. So while the motherboard doesn't have RGB, it does have Asus Aura Sync, and you do have ARGB Gen 2 headers that you can use. But if you look at the PCIe slot layout, you get three X16 slots. Now before you get excited, as some of the level one form already have, like, no, you don't magically have more PCIe lanes. You run it X8, X8, Gen 5, those are from the CPU. And then the bottom X16 slot, it's actually X4 electrical from the chipset. That's PCIe Gen 4 up two. Your M.2 connections are a mix of Gen 4 and Gen 5. The one Gen 5 also directly into the CPU, but then everything else is Gen 4, so there's not a lot to complain about there, really. Let's take a closer look at the board. <laughs> now, Spoiler alert, this board is one that Asus sent me, but I actually have a second board that I purchased a while ago for the review. But it's interesting because there's a couple quirks on my board that I wondered if it was just a quirk of my board or if it was a quirk of the board in general. We'll talk about that. So this is what you get out of the box. It's definitely an appealing out of box experience. Out of box experience. Uh, Close encounters of the third kind, something going on in Jersey. Also in the box, you get your Creator Wi-Fi mini manual. I like this trend. You don't need a you don't need a thick manual. Your ASUS Control Center Express. Please enjoy your license key. Some licensed software from ASUS comes with your motherboard. You get the Fancy Pants Wi-Fi antenna. Now this is a different style of antenna connector that is quick release. It doesn't thread on. It's nice. It's premium and Wi-Fi 7 is very fast. You get a lot of other accessories, SATA cables, M.2 mounting screws, ProArt ruler slash bookmark, rubber headers, a very short display port cable. This is for display in for the onboard USB 4. It's Thunderbolt compatible. We can't call it Thunderbolt. That's an Intel technology, but it's Thunderbolt compatible. So if you have Thunderbolt peripherals, you can't use it with this board. Although there's a caveat with that we need to talk about. And you get some extra thermal pads for your M.2. Uh, 22 110 as a matter of fact so if you wanted to run 110 millimeter m.2 on this motherboard you can which is a rare thing in this day and age they aren't kidding when they say it's for pro and creators i mean there are some people that are willing to pay the premium on a board like this just to be able to fit enterprise grade m.2 which are 110 millimeter m.2 like this which generate tons of heat or double-sided and have tons of chips on them. In specialty applications, you can also get FPGAs and AI accelerators on M.2. Some of those are 110. Those are low volume specialty applications, but again, ASUS got you covered. It has the M.2 Q release. Ta-da! There you go. Although I have to say it is a little disappointing that they didn't do the Q release on other slots because there are other boards from competitors that have made every single M.2 equally toolless. But still, that's very nice. Uh, also, I'm somewhat surprised uh, Asus on their motherboards, they have, you know, a quick release option to help the GPU release. And this is spring loaded, but it's not a push button release. So if you just looked at this, you would assume that these are normal uh, release PCIe slots when some of the like the ROG gaming series you hit a button over here and the GPU pops out Which is really handy when you're changing your GPU 17 times a day You think maybe Asus is adding features that are more for reviewers than ordinary people But this is actually spring-loaded so it's kind of a useful feature the bottom x16 slot is not spring-loaded So 
So it does kind of help you remove your GPU a little bit, but not, not quite. Four DIN slots up to DDR5-8000. I'll be testing ECC as regular as well as regular non-ECC memory. Still the case that AM5, generally I recommend just using two DIMMs. Four DIMMs, you're going to be running your memory slower, like 4800 or slower. 96 gigabytes with two 48 gig DIMMs. Definitely the sweet spot for the AM5 platform. If you want to run it, DDR5-6000, which is still the optimal ratio for gaming latency and everything else. So 96 gigs, DDR5, 6,000, 16 cores. That is the top of this platform. I am HO. Can you do four 48 gig DIMMs for 192 gigabytes of memory? You absolutely can, but you're going to pay the price because those DIMMs are not going to run a DDR5, 6,000. Or if they are, you're incredibly lucky. It's not guaranteed. Dual 8-pin power connections, dual 4-pin fan headers at the back here, USB Type-C, right angle 20-pin, USB 5 gigabit, I am genuinely surprised there's not two of those on a pro motherboard that's X870E. Three USB 2 headers, an RS-232 serial port. You get two 50-50 headers at the bottom, another 4-pin fan header, your audio connection, a 4-pin fan header at the front. Three analog temperature sensors, another 4-pin fan header at the front edge of the motherboard. Two SATA ports, which I actually agree with because SATA is basically a dying technology. You don't need a ton of SATA ports. Two SATA ports on this motherboard, I am okay with. And then you get an M.2, and you get an M.2, and you get an M.2. All the M.2. Asus also put these little rubber headers at the top on the 4-pin fan headers. Now, the other motherboard that I got did not have these rubber headers on the 4-pin fan header, but, you know, it was not a sealed box because it was retail. So, I don't know. At the rear I.O., we have DisplayPort N, HDMI, or three USB Type-C, which all do different things. They're 40 gigabit... USB Type-C with DisplayPort Alt mode and 20 gigabit USB. Then we have our Type-A ports above that, which are all 10 gigabit. Every single one of them, except this one, underneath the 2.5 gig LAN port, which is USB 2.0 and for your BIOS flashback. BIOS flashback is a really amazing feature so that when the 16 core X3D CPUs come out, for example, probably gonna need a BIOS update. If you buy that CPU and this motherboard, and this motherboard's been sitting around on a shelf for a while, that BIOS may not have support for that particular CPU. Not to worry, you can put it on a specially formatted flash disk and the file has to be specially named and you can hit a button and even if there's no CPU in this motherboard at all, the microcontroller on this motherboard can read from the USB and update the BIOS as long as the motherboard's getting power from the power supply. So that is a really super insanely handy feature and there's separate videos on that if you find yourself needing to use that feature. But just because you assemble your brand new system and it doesn't post and you can't get it to come on, doesn't necessarily mean anything is broken. It might just mean you need a BIOS update and you're gonna have to go through the BIOS flashback procedure to update your BIOS. Oh, and in case you're curious, the LAN connections, the 10 gig, a Quantia, that's Marvell, and then the two and a half gig is an Intel NIC. So an Intel two and a half gig, which are the good options in this day and age. So I'm reasonably happy with those choices. We've also got our Wi-Fi 7 antenna connectors, which are the quick release, the new style, not threaded. And then we've got our analog audio. I'm kind of surprised there's no optical SPDIF on this motherboard, but we do have line out, line in, and microphone in, which will get the job done. And don't forget, you've also got your front panel headers. So you can run 7.1 that way, but you're gonna be using both the front and rear audio to do it. This board, like my other one, has a little bit of flex in it. Again, kind of surprising for a motherboard at this price point. There's no, rear shield or anything like that. You don't really need a metal shield back here that is more structural and aesthetic than functional. A, an AMD CPU is very, very power efficient. So this type of power delivery and everything like that is overkill. But a lot of my compatriots will look at that and say, this is amazing, it's really well engineered. And you can overclock it, you know, 240 watts or whatever. But AMD CPUs are not really designed to give you a ton of margin for overclocking. A 16 core with PBO will use significantly more power, but it's really like, you would be hard pressed to find an AM5 CPU that's gonna use more than 240 watts, unless you're doing an extreme overclocking liquid nitrogen type scenario. You really don't need to be pushing your CPU like that. And so the board doesn't need overkill power delivery and yeah, it's fine. This is overkill power. There's a lot of things about this board that are overkill, but there's a couple things that aren't and it's just, Okay, but it's a, it's a reasonable motherboard. I also want to note that the four lanes in this physical PCIe slot also share uh, PCIe lanes with one of the M.2 slots. So if you're populating more than the, the primary M.2, which is this Gen 5, the one with the big heat sink, obviously, up here at the top, you wanna pay attention because 
you want to try to use the M.2 that shares lanes with the bottom PCIe slot last. So that should only affect you if you're using 4 M.2. Now for the motherboard testing and everything else that I did on the other board, we're using Crucial T705. This is one of the fastest uh, PCIe Gen 5 uh, drives that you can get. What do you need to know usage notes wise? All right. First of all, I'm delighted to tell you this motherboard properly supports ECC. That was one of the frustrating things when the ProArt series first launched from ASUS for AM5. ECC support there was half-baked. It was pretty much half-baked across almost every AM5 board that you could get with the first three or four months of launch of the Ryzen 7000 series CPUs. With Ryzen 9000 series CPUs upon us, ECC memory generally works. Now it's not registered ECC, it's a different kind of ECC, it's ECC UDIM. And those are still a little hard to get, but you can get 48 gigs ECC UDIMs in 4800 and 5600 speed. The kits that I have worked fine in this, uh, which are Micron and SK Hynix, I believe. Um, the model numbers, you can hit me up in the forum, model numbers are below, uh, lower third. But generally you can expect that ECC is gonna work correctly. I also did a video recently uh, on RAS daemon and the RAS daemon for Linux will work properly here. It also seems to be enabled in Windows, so you should be able to get it on the WHEA side of things. But I, I would add a caveat there that the RAS daemon support is more polished than what you get on the WHEA side. ASUS really could expose more options in BIOS for those things. Uh, IOMMU and the IOMMU breakdown, if you run two different peripherals in your X uh, 16 slots, X8, X8, you want to do a dual GPU configuration. If you're using like two slot GPUs, it does seem to work pretty well on this motherboard. The X870E chipset is a dual chipset solution. The IOMMU groups don't always convey to one or both chipsets because it's like a daisy chain type situation on the chipset. But on this board, it seems to work pretty well. I populated all three X16 slots and had two M.2, one to the CPU, one through the chipset. I had some unfortunate grouping with the onboard audio and the Intel i225V and one of the onboard USB controllers. But beyond that, you can get everything separately. If you use the ACS patch, I didn't experience any instability splitting out the things that were not otherwise split out. So this motherboard wouldn't be a terrible choice for uh, IOMMU experimentation with a 16 core you know, uh, AMD CPU. So yay. Now quirks and things that I would like to complain about. The 10 gig NIC sometimes doesn't come back from sleep and sometimes doesn't come back from a reboot when it doesn't come back from sleep. You have to power the system off and turn the rocker switch off. The system cannot have standby power. I reached out to Asus about that. And this being my second board, I was really curious, would that actually happen on the second board? And the answer is yes, because somebody showed up in the level one forums with a third board, and guess what it's doing? I'm happy to report though that even though Asus did not get back to me, there is actually a fix for that now. Just go update your BIOS, and you actually will probably have to do a full BIOS reset, so like if you save your settings and restore your settings, you seem to be able to restore the settings that causes the problem. So if you have saved your settings, and you update your BIOS, and then you restore your settings, don't do that. <laughs> save your settings, do a BIOS reset, and then just repick the same options, because I didn't think it was fixed, and it turns out it, it is actually fixed. So yay, good job. Pro art. It's retail, it's not even, it's not even the, the one, it's a different one, because sometimes stuff's different at retail. Pro Art AIO, yeah, Asus Pro Art AIO. Works pretty great. Now, an interesting quirk if you're gonna build a system with one of these, depending on which BIOS version you have on the board, it may not post with ECC UDIMs. I, I just had that problem. I switched to um, ADATA XPG memory, just good old fashioned non ECC, and guess what? It posted immediately, but our 48 gig dims, even letting it sit for 10 minutes, it did not post successfully. It would go to the white LED, but it would never actually display any video. This is a BIOS bug. The very latest version of the BIOS fixes this. Here's a quick tour of the ASUS BIOS on the ProArt. ASUS does not disappoint. You've got a lot of the same gamer tweak features, at least a lot of the common, I mean, yeah, on an ROG or gaming board, you could have a lot more gaming and overclocking options, but this is everything you need. They've got pretty full bifurcation support as well. It's a little weird, the labeling. 
you can configure X4, 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 but that's PCIe RAID mode. And um, the GPU plus M.2 is X8, X4, X4. It tells you that in the fine print though, which is appreciated. You've also got a ton of options around ASPM and SRIOV. Resize bar comes enabled right out of the box. And then you've got an ECC disable option as well. So you can explicitly disable ECC or explicitly enable it if you don't want to leave it on auto. 225, that's the one that's got the, the uh, ECC problem. Look, ECC option. Yay, except it won't post. It's this old version. Uh, second thing, I really would have liked to have seen the USB-C port capable of doing phone charging. This is a feature that has shown up on some competitor boards. And so like being able to deliver 35, 45, 65 watts through front USB-C, that would be amazing. Come on, Asus. Minor, minor, minor nit. Not even really a thing. But premium board, price, low bomb cost to add that. Eh, it'd be a pretty neat feature. But other than that, that's really all there is to complain about. It's a premium board. What do you expect? It's going to be a premium. And it delivers on its premium promise. It is an amazing chariot for a 16-core CPU or an X3D CPU or something else like that. If you see the X670E creator, and it is on sale because, you know, the 670 is on its way out, the 870 is on its way in, and it's significantly cheaper, go for the X670E. There's not enough difference between the X870E and the X670E, especially if you get all the BIOS updates for the X670E, to really make a difference. Um, Epic CPUs are also available in the AM5 format. If you were going to run these boards in... Uh, you know, a provider, you can go, you're going to provide, you know, gaming systems or gamer systems. Uh, there are Zen 4 based AMD Epic CPUs that will fit in this platform. And that'll work with or without the uh, error correcting UDIM memory. Those are fantastic in this motherboard. This as a reliable, repeatable, uh, optionally RS-232 console enabled for remote management um, system. This is a good choice for a board for those kinds of scenarios, for a lot of the reasons about BIOS and serial control and things like that. There's, there's only a couple of other like desktop class AM5 boards that that's really true for, plus also the full ECC support. So for a Linux or a dual boot system, this is a pretty solid recommendation, especially with the BIOS updates. And if you can score a deal on the X670E, that's an option. I also re reviewed the, the, uh, the B series chipset version, the older one, and I thought it caught too many features. So probably that will happen because, you know, there's some new chipsets coming for Zen 5 as well that are the less expensive version of the chipset, not the X870E, the single chip solution. Those boards could, there could be a 10 gigabit option in that, but we don't know yet. And so that might also cost less. There might be some, some cost down alter alternatives that still have 10 gigabit Ethernet. But, you know, dual 2.5 gig and 10 gig, it's a pretty solid option. And that's pretty much all there is to know about this motherboard. I really like the USB layout. You've got tons of USB connectivity. You'd be hard pressed to find more USB connectivity on any other AM5 board. Except for it only has the, the one front panel USB connection for USB 5 gigabit. The ROG boards have more USB connectivity. I, anyway, I'm Weddle, this is level one. This has been the ProArt X870E Creator Wi-Fi. It's a solid board. I'm sending out, I'm gonna go to the level one forums. Let me know if you have any questions or you wanna see anything in particular. All right, I'll see you there.